Inside the 18. I'm Michael Madgett, live from Los Angeles, California, for the first time in three months. No Saskia Weber today with us, but that's okay because, we, as always, we have Mr. Pro GK Academy himself, Omar Zini. And joining us because, man, I mean, this has been a long time coming. People have been asking for this over and over and over again. When are you guys going to talk Prem? When are you guys going to talk Prem? I don't know. When the Prem comes back. Maybe, maybe we'll have to wait until the Prem comes back. And sure enough, the Prem decided to come back. So we've got senior goalkeeper analyst for The Athletic. That's right, The Athletic, on with us right now. You know him. You love him. Matt Pizdrowski, what is up, dude? Hey, how's it going? Happy to be back. This is uh, strange times, but this is uh, this is cool. Definitely excited to be back and uh, yeah, talk what we love talking about football and goalkeepers. Yeah, man, it was uh, it was interesting because uh, you came on last time you were on was during the uh, MLS preview. That uh, yeah, it was that- right before everything changed in the world. <laughs> It was so interesting because we put this whole MLS preview together and yeah. it just literally, it feels like we have to do another one for the MLS's back tournament. Cause it's like, like it was so funny cause we were talking to Spencer Ritchie last week and he's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, it's good. You guys put up a preview together for two games. So, uh, <laughs> really, really useful for the, uh, for the audience out there. But, uh, but man, you know, when we, when we had you on, you know, the Premier League was obviously in full swing and, and, you know, there were people actually who were chiming in and asking all these Premier League questions for our MLS preview. And we're like, well, I mean, we just don't have the time, man. We just don't have the time. So uh, it's awesome that we finally, we finally get to kind of go into this. And um, for those of you guys who are not familiar kind of with like Matt's work and like what you do for the athletic, why don't you kind of break it down for everybody? Yeah. um, I'm covering all things goalkeeping for the athletic, for the U S site, for the UK site. Uh, cover a ton of Premier League stuff. Uh, that's actually primarily what I cover is, is uh, you know, all the goalkeepers there. Um, you know, breaking down kind of big plays that happen, whether it's, a, you know, a good result, you know, whether it's a nice save or maybe something kind of goes wrong and kind of explaining for the masses. And I know we'll get into this more later, um, you know, about what exactly went wrong, you know, trying to kind of bring an understanding, you know, more to the goalkeeper position, just so everybody can really, have a feeling what it's like to stand between the posts. Yeah. And one of the things that we're going to try to do in this episode too, is also going to talk about like why proper goalkeeper analysis is important in just even just casual traditional media. You know, I think one of the problems that happens and, and we'll get into it later is that a lot of times people go like, well, if you want goalkeeper analysis, go to goalkeeper specific stuff. But the problem is, is then, then the casual observer never really understands the position. And then we blame them for always bringing mistakes up on, 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 on a highlight show or, you know, just an incredible save that was actually poor technique, like those sorts of things. And, and it's not their fault that they just, just haven't been educated. Roy Keane. Right. I mean, that's the number one yeah. <laughs> as of late. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely not a fan of the goalkeeper community. That's for sure. <laughs> not many people are fans of him. That's the, uh, that's the goat thing. That's why I was always like so impressed with, uh, Peter Schmeichel and how like his personality would deal with a captain like that. You know, I feel like that is uh, the right person to meet head on. Of course, like it's probably uncomfortable for the teammates, but seeing Roy Keane and Peter Schmeichel plus, I mean, Sir Alex Ferguson, who's a hothead himself. I I can't even imagine all three of those guys really uh, coexisting without one of them bursting a blood vessel or going crazy. (laughs) <laughs> well, well, speaking speaking of uh of what's been going wrong and what's been going right, let's kind of get, get right into it, and let's start with kind of basically everything that everybody's been trying to talk about for the last twenty four hours or so has really centered around Joe Hart, um, and obviously the interview um that that surfaced, and uh, it's kind of heartbreaking, honestly, mm-hmm. Matt, to to see that. Yeah, it is. It's uh you know when you really think about his career trajectory, you know, and kind of how things have have really you know, hit a snag in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, he was super promising, um, young goalkeeper, 2009, 2010, he was in Birmingham, I believe it was, and had an excellent season there. And then he obviously goes back to city, comes back from his loan and goes to city and, you know, has a great run for five years. Um, I mean, he's definitely the best English goalkeeper during that time. Um, but you know, for the national team, he just kind of never really ever put it together. Um, you know, and then obviously when Pep came over, you know, he, he said right away that, you know, I think you're a good goalkeeper, but you're not what I'm looking for in my system. And it just kind of seems like everything's, you know, changed since that moment. Um, you know, and obviously there can be discussions on why it happened, but to me, it's all psychological. 
Um, you know, I think it's, we've all stood between, between the posts. We know what it's like to have confidence and have the backing of your manager. And when you don't, and especially with a guy who's, you know, as well regarded as Pep, I mean, that can hurt, you know, and that can definitely bruise the ego, bruise the confidence. Um, you know, and that's kind of what he, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't say he's struggling with his confidence at all. You know, he's obviously still a pretty positive guy, but, uh, you know, I think when you just look at the way he's been performing, like to me, that's case in point what the issue is. Uh, Omar, in regards to this, who do you think is, is in a, a digger, bigger hole right now, Loris Karius or, um, Joe Hart? That's actually, I mean, that's such a good question. Um, Honestly, I would probably say Joe Hart is only because, I mean, I think the writing's been on the wall for the past few years that not many people are giving him opportunities. At least Karius was given an opportunity going to Turkey, uh, which I think it was Trevor who mentioned that they were almost paying him to, like, just not play. They were just like, we're, we're kind of over, we're kind of done with uh, your antics. And I, I mean, there was like two or three goals where it was like he was setting up for a cross. They crossed it in, but it turned into one of those cross shots and it went in and he, you know, the ball goes in and it's almost like his teammates are like, well, you know, we almost budgeted that mistake from you. And I, as soon as you lose the locker room in terms of the players kind of giving you uh, like a, not even like, Hey man, let's go. Let's, let's, you know, let's, let's bounce back more of just like, all right, whatever it happened. Let's go. Let's, let's, let's continue. I think that is where I think uh, uh, Carius is at, but I still don't think, he's old enough where they can ride him off. He's like, I think 27. So I think he still has some time, but Joe Hart's getting to the age now where he's almost been out of the league for the last few years and not many teams want to take a chance on him. I don't know. He seems like a nice guy, but from an article that I read today, it seemed like he was pretty egotistical at his peak. You know what I mean? Like being England's number one, you know, obviously with Man City. And he was the kind of guy who uh, wore his heart in his sleeve, which is not to say that's bad, but I think that some people were not, that upset when this kind of all went down they were like you know he needed to be knocked down a few notches i mean look i hear here's here's one of the things in in regards to that um i've always said that you're going to meet the same people on the way down as you meet on the way up and again i don't know joe hart personally but that's that's one of those things that i would just always say is that when you see such a significant drop in somebody and, and having difficulty you know landing a job you know, I mean, you have to say, honestly, Piz, right, at 33 years old, that Joe Hart is still a Premier League caliber keeper, right? That he can still play in the Premier at some level, right? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I, I think he will get an opportunity for championship. I really don't know. You know, he could, you know, for example, with, you know, one of the bigger clubs in the championship or maybe one of these Premier League clubs that goes down this season could bring him in and kind of give him a chance. Um, I mean, he said in that interview, you know, with BBC Sport, like he said, like, I just need someone to believe in me. Um, 33, yeah, he's obviously his best football is behind him, but like as a goalkeeper, he could play for another six, seven years. Um, you know, he is definitely a guy who takes care of himself. Um, I understand how, you know, even how Omar had said, you know, like, you know, the, the attitude may be kind of rubbing some people the wrong way at certain points, but also I think just from a perspective, like a competition perspective, I think that's what drove him, you know, and I think it's kind of similar to what you're seeing with, Jordan Pickford now, you know, and, and as well, you're seeing a lot of the same complaints and nitpicking with him that you saw with Joe Hart, um, both intense guys. You know, the thing is like, if you take that intensity away from either of them, they're not the players that they actually are. Um, so it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword because it's what makes them great, but also it's what can kind of crumble them in some crucial moments as well, because as we all know, you need to be level-headed, you know, when everything's going to chaos around you. I mean, look, I think, I, yeah. I think go ahead, Omar. No, my God, I think, Matt, that's a huge, huge point, which is like, it's that fine line, a double-edged sword of success, but also to you rub people the wrong way. I mean, as we saw yeah. with the last dance with Michael Jordan, I mean, even with, yeah. even with Kobe yeah. Bryant, you know, a lot of people when obviously he passed, there were certain people who didn't show up to things because of how deep rooted their hatred yeah. was for him. You know, obviously they, you know, they, you know, show remorse and all that stuff, but like he, they, he used to trash talk them so deeply, obviously with the same kind of mentality as the Michael Jordan kind of that killer mentality where when they're at the top you love them I mean you can't have enough it's like you want to almost define a winner by showing the Michael Jordan clip and how he trash talks and how he has you know peace through crazy you know last 10 seconds of a game how calm he is but at the same time too it's like you put that guy as an aging superstar on a team 
that doesn't want that. We saw with the Washington Wizards later on. I know Michael Mack and I always send this to a basketball podcast. By the way, by the way, Omar, I don't think anyone has ever put Joe Hart and Michael Jordan in the same breath. This is. Uh, I'm talking about the mentality. I'm talking about the oh, mentality of the mentality because yep. because Michael Jordan because Michael Jordan was so great. People were almost okay with how crazy he was because they knew that if they are okay with this, they'll win championships. And if they can, right. you know, sustain their mental capacity for somebody as, as, as much of an instinct as he was, you kind of had to be okay with it. So I'm thinking with Joe Hart, like you say, with Pickford, they have that kind of killer's mentality where they go out there and everything, everything they can possibly do, whether it's yelling at a teammate, whether it's, you know, showing crazy emotion or pumping their chest in the locker room, whatever it is, that's going to get them going. That's going to get them to their top. And I think Joe Hart did that for so many years was swept under the rug. No one ever talked about it. Then all of a sudden, he had this you know, fallout with Man City, and now everyone's talking about his attitude. Like, where was that same energy when he was winning things, when he was the number one? I think a lot of people, like we're seeing now with like this cancel culture on, on Twitter and stuff, people have receipts, and they're always waiting for that opportunity for somebody to slip up, and then from there, they're going to jump in and uh, you know, go for blood. So I think that's where I think you made a really good point about the whole pick for thing and that comparison. So. Yeah, look, I, I think one of the things, too, that you have to t- take into consideration as well, too, is, is the price tag. You know, based on the pedigree, is Joe Hart willing to – I don't know what his, I don't know what his deal um, – was he the third or was he – he was the third at Burnley, right? Was the third or the or – the, Yeah, back up. I mean, they had like nine goalkeepers defending. on that team. Yeah, so, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at, at one point they had three England internationals with Tom Heaton, uh, Joe Hart, and then uh, what's his name? Uh, Pope. Yeah. So, uh, God, I shouldn't forget Pope. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was really insane. They had Tom. They had they had Pope, Nick Pope, Tom yeah. Heaton, and Joe Hart all on the same team at the same time. Yeah, it's crazy. exactly. Um, you know, and really, there could be an argument made that all three of them could have been called up at the same time too. So it's yeah, it was re- really strange, really weird how they stockpiled that. But, you know, I think the biggest thing with Joe is he's going to have to take a pay cut regardless, um, you know, because he's been on quite a bit of money for a long time. Um, you know, and now he's finally out of contract for, you know, the first time in ages. And, uh, you know, that's one thing he's just going to have to sacrifice. And if, you know, his words ring true, which he kind of spoke in, you know, the last 24 hours, uh, you know, in the interview, you know, he says he wants to play. He says he wants someone to believe in him. You know, that's probably a sacrifice he's going to have to make is, you know, on the financial side. Um, but he's made a buttload of money in the past, so it shouldn't be an issue, yeah. in my opinion. I, I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, look, if you want to, if you want to play, you want to play. I mean, like, sign with Luton Town, you know, and uh, and 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 prove your worth. I mean, look, I mean, that's obviously a team that's struggling in the championship. But if you can go there and you can and you can showcase that you can play at that type of a level, um, that's exceeding the level that you're that the competition that you're playing at. Well, then maybe that'll that'll get some alphas in 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 the winter or something like that. I mean, I, I don't yeah. see him making a decision to go play in the championship, but like, you know, maybe, maybe that would be the, the best move for him. I mean, the problem with Joe Hart is like, it seems like that going overseas doesn't seem to be the move either, you know, for what happened when he went over to, uh, to Italy, that, that really seemed to be kind of the breaking point that kind of, they kind of had that, uh, you know, he came back and obviously he was a backup in the Premier League, but it's still not the same as playing. Um, yeah, I think it's just also too stigma and like image and, and how you portray somebody is huge in terms of their own perception of themselves and like the public's perception of them. I think the whole Pep uh, incident, I don't think we've ever seen such a fall from grace from somebody being the most sought, not sought after, but someone who even I would watch and I would go like I would wake up when I was younger to watch Petr Cech games. And I'm not a Chelsea fan. I used to wake up and watch Man United games uh, to see Van der Sar, to see De Gea, to see you know, uh, Peter Schmeichel. But I wasn't a Man U fan and it attracted me to that. So I used to watch Joe Hart as well with Man City when they had their runs and I held him in such high regard. And then it was just so public and how Pep kind of threw him to the side with no regard for emotions, no, it's all business and how public that breakup was, I think allowed a lot of people to say, Oh my God, maybe he's not as good as we think he is. And then I think he probably thought that it was, it kind of showed in his play and it's kind of, what have you done for me lately? And he hasn't really done much when he's had the opportunity to play. So within the perception of, of the fans and of people, they probably see him as like a washed out talent. And I hate to bring back basketball, but if you look at, Carmelo Anthony, for example, everybody loves him, but as soon as they want him to come play for him, he's not the guy they want to play with. So it's kind of like that where he's an aging superstar. He's, I mean, you know, uh, Joe Hart's won more than Carmelo Anthony has, 
but still, you know, it's kind of, it, it's just kind of like, you know, so you but it's like, Joe, Joe Hart more in the Kyrie Irving uh, boat. <laughs> Kyrie Irving's too young still. I'm going to give him some time, but, uh, but no, I think, and I think that's, uh, if anything, we, we just discuss, you know, the importance of, you know, psychological, I mean, balance. And I think, you know, because someone like Joe Hart, not saying he hasn't had to do anything in terms of fight back prior to his Man City days, but I think he has kind of been that go-to guy. And as soon as he wasn't, it was, it was difficult for him to kind of uh, figure out a way to maneuver and navigate through that. So I'm hoping that he's, in this time off, he's learned, like you said, might go to Luton Town or somewhere where he can take a price cut, uh, pay cut, but at the same time, he'll still get the love of playing. And then from there, maybe he has a second, you know, second coming in his career, rekindle something, and then he comes back to the Premier League, plays for a lower team and builds himself up. We saw with Ben Foster going to Man U yeah. for, for a year, didn't play that much, had a few okay games, and then he's been on these lower teams like Watford for, for a few years now. And yeah, he's, he's, like crushed it. he's crushed it at Watford. Yeah, he, he, crushed he's it at Watford. Watford. But yeah, I, mean, I know. He's, he's going to be 40 years old in a couple of years, and like, yeah. he's going to play. Like, he's going to play, and he's, he's unreal. Like, I actually think – I know he's not going to get called into the national team, um, but when I wrote this article, you know, a couple months ago uh, – about the the England goalkeeper setup, like I said, like he deserves a spot because he does. Like if you're just going on his play, Ben Foster has been a top three goalkeeper, English goalkeeper this year. Period. Rough mistake the last week though. I will give unfortunate yeah. that <laughs> almost yeah. like the, the the like the kneel and throw kind of thing. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's uh let, let let's move on from there. Um, we were obviously talking, you know, former city keeper and Joe Hart. Let's move on to current city keeper um, Ederson. Um, one of the things that was brought up, and this is actually a really fascinating debate, is it was recently by a lot of people is like, if you switch out Ederson and Allison, you know, how much does that affect either squad? You know, I personally, I still think Liverpool still wins the title this year. There's no way, no way whatsoever that 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 they don't. Um, and, and another fascinating debate that actually Matt brought up, which I'd never even thought about, but this is actually really cool. If Ederson's distribution is taken out of the equation, or Allison's for that matter, are they still world-class top tier? Now, I went and I watched probably about half an hour of footage of both of them. And I will say, without a shadow of a doubt, if Allison's distribution was still not there he would still be a top-tier world-class goalkeeper. His positioning is so good. His understanding of how to read angles is so solid. He steers balls in the right direction. His distribution with his hands is good. Um, his field awareness of when to come out, you know, how to cover space, you know, when to drop, those sorts of things, handling balls in the air. Ederson, in my opinion if he did not have the distribution skills, would not be a top-tier goalkeeper. Um, he spills balls in bad spaces. He's tech, way too close to near post, in my opinion, a lot of times. Um, he's a great, great reflex. He's a great shot stopper. But there doesn't really seem to be any decision-making on where to play that ball. It's more reflexes, get it out of the way. Um, and he makes up for it because he's just a fantastic, fantastic field player. Um, Matt, thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it was something I don't want to take credit for uh, to really introducing that because I actually had seen it on uh, on Twitter the other day. But I thought it was a great topic to talk about just because it really got me thinking as well and, you know, got everything turning in, in my brain about, you know, would they be as well regarded? Um, I agree with you that Allison, I think Allison still would be a top, top goalkeeper. Um, he would not be on the level that he is just because the distribution makes him complete. Um, Ederson, in my opinion, with his feet, he's just like, he's on a different level to almost every single other goalkeeper in the world with his feet, um, his calmness, uh, composure under pressure, uh, the way he's able to ping, you know, a ball 70 meters, you know, off of one step accurately is just unreal. Um, I don't know. I think th to me, I guess it kind of depends on how you determine, you know, a top goalkeeper. Are we talking about a top five, 10 in the world? Or are we talking a top 20? Cause I think if you take his feet away, he's still a top 20 goalkeeper in the world, Ederson, but he's not in contention for a top five, you know, which I think he's a top five goalkeeper, everything, you know, put together. Omar. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's the discussion of even, you know, not even switching teams, but you know, would they, would Brazil still be as successful having Ederson at the world cup or having Ederson at Copa America? And I think for the most part, they would uh, only because they're on such dominant teams that they're not being called upon so much. They just need a goalkeeper who's not going to 
default or to give themselves, give themselves up easily. And I think that's where obviously, and make stupid mistakes, you know, back to Mignolet and Karius. Liverpool were just so close to, to, you know, winning a lot of, a lot of titles, but their goalkeepers just kept on putting them behind the eight ball. And then from there, they're playing catch up and those teams aren't do, don't do well playing uh, from behind. They do very, very well and the game is even and they can spread things out. They get that one or two, you know, uh, goal lead. The other team has to, you know, try to create chances and they catch them on the counter attack with Salah and Mane. So I think that would have, you know, if that works out the way it does, I think those goalkeepers still would be effective on each other's teams. But to your point, Mike, I would say Allison is more of a complete goalkeeper because his technical awareness, even on 1v1s, his savviness to slow his body down is just on another level. And I don't know if it's Ederson or, or why he's not in that same realm, but I would just say that I think his feet with Man City hide a lot of a lot of the deficiencies in their style of play hide a lot of the things that would be highlighted on a team like a Watford where he's getting a lot of shots and he wouldn't be able to uh, get away with some of that poor technique and I think we're even seeing it with De Gea at times too you know he got so many shots early you know in his career because of how bad United were kind of like them turning the corner without Ferguson that they were getting a lot of shots and he was the kind of goalkeeper who was you know extremely extremely benefiting off of those shots and then now he's barely getting one or two shots a game. And you can see those deficiencies in his decision-making and his shot-stopping ability when he's still kind of cold. And I think that is, again, it's a lot of situational stuff. But if we're breaking it down based off of that, I would say that they'd probably still look the same. But Allison is more of a complete goalkeeper. I mean, look. Okay, I, I, I'm sorry. Ahead, I, I want Omar to have a follow-up here. Great point about De Gea. So what do you think the issue is? Do you think it's psychological or technical? Uh, I would say both, but more so the psychological is causing him to overthink a lot. It's causing him to overthink a lot of things. And even, you know, when we've played and when we train, a lot of times when we're trying to feed information to our goalkeepers, they're thinking it instead of feeling it. And I think right now he's just overthinking a lot of things. And I think he's either trying out new technical stuff or, you know, being told to try out new stuff so that when he's, you know, getting a shot, his instinct is to... I don't know what's going on with him, but his instincts aren't all there. And I think yeah. he's just more, he's more of a shot stopping guy. And a lot of teams are figuring that out where it's like, let's just see if we can just put some shots on, just put some shots on frame and see what he does. And as we've yeah. seen against, I think it was Watford. He like dropped the ball and against, uh, I mean, there's been so many that make you kind of go, wow, did this guy, you know, is he a part of like the space jam, like Monstars? Like they, they took his power. It's like, what, he's, Sean what's, Bra- like he's, what? Sean Bradley, he's Sean Bradley on the Monstars after they took the power. Exactly. Yeah, but it's all, I, think, I think it's majority psychological because, you know, the technique and, and his shot stopping ability has always been there. But I think the psychological of maybe even getting different coaches and different goalkeeper coaches who are trying to implement new things and trying to refine certain things about him, that maybe he is... Uh, you know, trying new things and we're just watching the process of him getting better. Who knows? But no, yeah. no, that's a really, that's a really good point you brought up there, Omar. And I was actually going to say that until you stole it, um, is that I don't <laughs> think there's been another top tier goalkeeper who's had that much turnover in regards to uh, who's been um, their teacher, you know, who's been their, their mentor, uh, if, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, back there. And, um, and I think that that says a lot at that top level. I mean, look at Jan Oblak. He's had pretty much stability the entire time he's been at Letico. Look at that save he had first off on, on, uh, on the deflection from the messy free kick yesterday. That was unreal reactions to be able to adjust like that and, and play that ball over like that. Um, but that, that, has a, that has a lot about it. If, if you're getting a different, uh, you know, different voice in your ear over and over again, and a lot of it is his fault because a lot of, from what I've heard, it's just that he doesn't vibe with a lot of goalkeeper coaches and they, they keep trying to find people, people that work for him. Um, you know, I think that, I think that's going to affect it. And, and honestly, I, I want to move on to Dean Henderson right here because you know, that's a, what, it, what happens every single time United, you know, United uh, is not doing well or De Gea makes a mistake or whatever. Is I go, Oh, we got, we, we got Dean Henderson right in the wings, right at Sheffield right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> Don't ever That's do that. that English accent again. Yeah, I'm never going to try to do that again. Um, it sounds a little more Australian, actually. Um, but no, but I mean, honestly, for real, though, and – and that's got to be annoying when you're, you're hearing about a guy who, um, you know, is not even, at the, not even at the club. He's obviously on loan, obviously highly regarded um, by the club. Um, several years, you're, 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 you're minor. And, uh, and everyone's just waiting for you to screw up so that that guy can come, come in and take the number one spot. Yeah. 
you know? No, that's tough. Um, that's tough. I think that's uh, that. I mean, that's that's what comes with playing professional football, man. I think there's a lot of pressure, and I think unfortunately, you know, for better or for worse, there are some guys who just don't do well with that added pressure behind them. Um, I think even you look at Keppa, for example. I think with that whole mix-up with Sar- uh, sorry, right, doing the the against oh, Man last City, year. That, that, yeah, yeah, like and he was like you know put on the bench. Caballero got you know a few minutes, and Caballero didn't do that bad. But I think you know when you put a price tag on some of those goalkeepers, there's a lot of pressure that's thrown onto them. And when you we don't have that mental makeup, and even with with Keppa, sorry to switch the subject, but even with Keppa, for example, his price tag was so high that he not that he didn't deserve it but he hasn't been through those experiences over the years so that he has thick enough skin to c- overcome all of that. Okay. Well, kept us having two or three bad games. Let's go find Jordan Pickford. I think Jordan Pickford was having like a night. They were thinking about bringing him to Chelsea for a little bit. So like all those discussions are always going to be had. If the goalkeeper that's playing isn't playing up to speed, you don't see them with old black. No one's ever talking about where is it, where who's coming to Atletico because he's so consistent. And I think when it comes to, uh, this situation, Mike, I think Dean Henderson has just played so well, but you can't equate playing for Sheffield to Man United. And that's, that's no, but what I mean, like. did, you see, did you see the game he had last week, though? I mean, the thing is, is Dean Henderson is a very, very good goalkeeper. I mean, the only thing you could maybe say about him is he's slightly undersized to be that top, top class level. Uh, he's, what, about six one and a half, maybe? Uh, uh, so, but, is, so is Ter Stegen. I mean, that, maybe, but in the Premier yeah. League is different. No, yeah, that, that's, it is, but, that's true. He, he Henderson is excellent. He is going to be, I think he's already really, really good, but I think he's going to be one of the best English goalkeepers we've seen in a long, long time. But as Omar said, what he's facing at Sheffield United right now is like one tenth of the pressure he would face at Manchester United. Um, he's had one Premier League season. Um, I've written about him a lot for the athletic. I'm a huge supporter of his, but I think it's kind of naive from a lot of people to expect De Gea is going to be close to 10 years at United. And, you know, he knows what it's like to play for that club. He knows what is expected of him. And it's not to say that Dean Henderson doesn't, but the type of scrutiny he would get at United is going to be so much different. And he's got to get some more experience. Um, you got to see how he does after a good season. Um, you know, it's how many goalkeepers have had an excellent season? A lot. But anyone will tell you who's actually been through a top season like that, it's even harder to do it again. Um, now, I was actually just, you know just going to say that. Oh, go ahead, Matt. You finish up. So No, go ahead. I was just going to say that not that they're the same goalkeeper, although I do think that I do think there are similarities. I think Jordan Pickford at Sunderland, this is kind of reminding me of Jordan Pickford's rise kind of at Sunderland. And then all of a sudden everybody's saying like, well, maybe, maybe you should go to Liverpool, yada, yada, yada. Um, you know, this guy's, kind of the next great guy he goes over to Everton and and it hasn't been smooth sailing for Jordan Pickford at at Everton um so you know there's a a lot to be said about that um that being said I think Dean Henderson is extremely extremely savvy when it comes to the position for somebody his age his understanding of where to play the ball first off is, is is pretty high level for somebody at that age at at for first Premier League season you know I've seen him switch point of attack very quickly find the right openings, making good decisions um, from a shot stopping standpoint. You know, he's dynamic and he doesn't give up bad spills, which I think is so, so important if you're playing for a team like Sheffield. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, yeah, I, I would agree. And I think uh, to Matt's point though, I think that's where we need to just hold the horses a little bit, take it yeah. easy with our expectations for these younger goalkeepers. And I think, whenever there's something new or a new toy out there, we all get super excited. And sometimes we, we don't know how to use that. We don't know how to bottle that energy in the right way. So we have patience so we can actually use this, you know, goalkeeper and put them at the highest level for years and years to come. We ask for so much from them so early. And then when we don't get what we don't, you know, wait for, we're not patient for, we get all upset and then we cast them off right away. We look for the next best solution. So I really hope that United is smart, which it seems like they are. They're paying money for De Gea right now, letting, uh, you know, uh, get kind of get, a, you know, thicker skin, but also to get a little bit of a taste, Dean Henderson, get a little bit of a taste of the Premier League so that once they do bring him back, and I know they will at some point, he's going he's gonna to be able to be their goalkeeper for five to ten years. And I think, like, like Matt said, he has the capability to be England's number one in the future as well. Just because he has such, I mean, he has, not even like from the physical side of things, like the composure and from that young of an age to be able to, I think, I forget which team it was. He, he, he conceded a really bad goal. It was like a between Liverpool. his legs. 
it was that against Liverpool. And I think like Peter Schmeichel was like, Hey, you know, you know, we all, we all go through these kind of things, like, you know, just pick your head up. And yeah. from there he is, you know, he's been very, very consistent and you could tell that he's grown. So sometimes you need those goalkeepers to make those errors for lesser teams because they get swept under the rug. No one really talks about it as much. And people are quicker, quicker to forget about it unless you're rooting, rooting for that team. And then you have two or three string of good games, and now all of a sudden you're back in, in uh, the limelight and everyone's saying how great you are. So I think right. they, he, needs to, he needs to earn his stripes for lesser teams and get those uh, mistakes ironed out so that once he does come to United, it's just smooth sailing from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th- I think you've brought up some, some really good points there. I, I want to talk about this, though, in regards to always looking for the next new toy because there's like one guy that, you know, all three of us actually have had conversations in the past week about underrated, underrated, underrated. And, you know, obviously Lester's struggling a little bit right now after the, uh, the restart. Um, but Casper Schmeichel, I mean, he's consistently, consistently one of the, one of the top goalkeepers in, in the Premier League. Um, and just people, I mean, look at even World Cup 2018. I mean, you know, there was an argument after group stage that he was in the running for the Golden Glove. And just for whatever reason, he doesn't seem to ever be in these conversations. And I don't know if it's just because of the last name, you know, on, on the back of his jersey. Um, but he is, he's a very, very good veteran goalkeeper. I mean, and, and just, Matt, why? Why doesn't he get the respect? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I've thought about this a lot because I've been a big fan of his for a long time. Um, I think he's a total goalkeeper. Um, He's the type of guy who can be really, really calm for your team, but also he's the guy who can, you know, puff out his chest and, you know, just like his father did, you know, bark at his teammates and, you know, kind of demand, you know, their attention and their, uh, you know, their respect. Um, you know, he's, he's great with his feet. I love the way he pings the ball. Like the way he pings the ball is just so sexy, just the way it comes off his foot. Um, you know, he can clip it to his outside backs, to his wingers, uh, hit that side volley, you know, to, to do a streaking runner. Um, he's good in the air. He's a great line goalkeeper. Um, really, really good in one V one situations as well. Um, so for me, like he's, he's excellent, you know, and it's, I, I hate to talk about his dad because I think he has Casper has earned the right to be considered, you know, have his name on his own. You know, I think he's totally walked out of his, his, his father's shadow but to me it's so remarkable that he's the son of Peter Schmeichel who had as good of a career that he had and now he's playing the exact same position and he's been unreal I mean I've played with guys who've had very famous fathers um, you know in different sports growing up as a professional it's hard um, to see what they deal with you know always being compared to their father and I think for him he's you know, he's, he's totally, you know, over succeeded in, in my opinion, you know, what you ever thought he could have been. And, uh, you know, it's, it's awesome. You know, and I, I, to me, he's absolutely one of the most, uh, underrated goalkeepers in the world, but also like to me, I consider him a top 10 goalkeeper in the world. You know, I think he's, like I said, I think he's the total package. I mean, and, and he's also perfected the Danish catch, which, uh, is very difficult to do. <laughs> If you, yeah, you know, he, did, you ever, did you ever try it, Matt? <laughs> yeah, I have tried it. I remember when I when I had seen it. Uh, I actually think I saw it from from Omar's post, and uh, <laughs> like I had to take like ten to twenty looks just to like actually see what happened, just because it happens so <laughs> fast and it's so smooth. Um, and it's crazy because like I've had a lot of Danish teammates throughout the years, never a goalkeeper. Um, you know, but after that post went viral, like a lot more Danish keepers start talking. We're like, yeah, we're taught this from like a young age, um, which I think is really, really interesting and really unique that it kind of took this long for it to come into focus. Yeah. All because of Omar's post. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Omar, the trendsetter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's um, everything Matt just said about, about Casper. I think he's definitely played himself out of his dad's shadow and he's probably – you know, there are a few goalkeepers that you look at and go, that's, you know, in terms of a modern goalkeeper, can I show you just the way somebody plays? And I think Casper, along with Ter Stegen, along with Neuer, along with certain goalkeepers that you can think of, those are the guys you look at and go, okay, they have everything from distribution to foot speed to communication to presence. Mm-hmm. They have all the things you, that you would want, especially on 1v1s too, how patient he is. He knows exactly when to use the block save. 
he's just very disciplined with his technique. So I definitely will give him that. But I think, I don't know, Mike and, and Matt, I don't know what it is, but I think just the United States and like the world in general, we always try to over uh, sensationalize people who are, you know, at the highest of highest. And if somebody who was like, you know, kind of struggling, we look for all this drama that we're trying to, uh, to, you know, put in the newspaper. That's what sells. So I think with Casper, he's, he's kind of like flown under the radar because he's been so consistent that we don't yeah. really have much to say about him. Like there's nobody on either side of the spectrum going, Casper Schmeichel is having this awful, awful season. Oh my God, what's going on? He's nothing like his father. And he's not having a great season when people are like, oh my God, this guy's amazing. He's just under the radar of amazing. And, and I mean, he's pretty far away from being uh, a liability, but he's just under the bar of being so great to, 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 to talk about. And I think that's probably where he wants to be. He's on a low profile team like Leicester City. Obviously, they had their run in 2015 16. So he had a good season there. Second in shutouts. I think he was uh, have here, second in touches. He did a really, really good season that year. Obviously, the World Cup in 2018, where he saved the PK against Croatia in the uh, round of 16 or the quarterfinal. So he, he's had his moments. But I think he's just, I think he's happy being where he is, where he can fine tune his craft without having the, the newspapers or the media really. Uh, uh, hone in on him and, and really magnify his mistakes. And he's the kind of guy too, with being on a lower profile team, if he does make a mistake, he doesn't make the same mistake twice. And I think that's also what I love about him. If you watch like the, the gloved, uh, gloves podcast with uh, Joe Hart and him, you can tell the guy has some arrogance to him. And you can mm-hmm. tell that when Joe Hart talks to him, that like some of the answers that he gives, you just go, ah, oh, I can see why this guy's a professional goalkeeper. Like you could tell that he, the way he carries himself and the way he's answering some of these questions, it's like, how could you ask me that question? That's beneath me. You know, I'm better. You know what I mean? So I think, I think he has, he has everything that you need as a number one goalkeeper for a country, but at the same time too, being on a, on a team that's not in the newspapers all the time. I think it suits him really well in his personality and why he's been kind of, uh, I would say underrated Mike, but I, I just don't think as discussed. And I think he'd probably uh, like to keep it that way. I, I, I want to bring up one thing is I think, something that really represents who Casper is as a goalkeeper is just even that play on Pulisic last week. Um, Oh my God. Yeah. That was fantastic. I mean, in regards to just the way he controlled his body there, the way he kept his shape right there as that shot was hit for those of you guys who did not to see this ball. um, And Pulisic was in perfect goal scoring opportunity. I mean, he was probably what about four, four to five yards. um, I would say. And, uh, and Schmeichel, Unlike an Ed- Ederson, and no disrespect to Ederson, Ederson hits that ball back into traffic, in my opinion. Just his reflexes, he hits that ball back into traffic. But Schmeichel, with the control of his body, not only makes contact with the ball and keeps shape, but also steers his body enough to play the ball over post. Yeah. And, and I think that is, that's world-class goalkeeping, in my opinion. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. You know? Um, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, somebody else, man. It's, it's crazy how everything is kind of rotating around man, man city and Schmeichel spent time at man city and all, all the, the man city talk, but, um, Zach Steffen, as we all know, Dusseldorf got relegated. Um, so my guess is that loan will be, will be terminated. I don't know if that already has happened. Uh, he had some health yeah, issues they, there. They posted something about it. They posted something about it yesterday on their Instagram page. Like, thank you to Zach Steffen. Okay. Yeah. It was, um, it was only supposed to be a one year loan. Yeah, that, that, that's, what I, that's what I thought, but he was playing so well um, as he had pretty much become the, the number one there uh, until the, the health issues, obviously, at the, the end of uh, 2019. Um, but now a lot of people are talking about, like, okay, what's, ne- what's next for Zach Steffen? What's next for Zach Steffen? Matt, should and can, I don't know what the, the EU permit status situation is for him right now, should Zach Steffen go on loan to a Premier League club next year? I think it'll be really interesting to kind of see what happens at City because by all accounts, Bravo's going to be gone. Um, you know, he's in, I'm pretty sure his contract's up after this year. If it's not this year, it's next year. Um, you know, so I actually have some inside information. Um, I'm not going to say the guy's name because I'm not sure if I'm supposed to share that. Um, but City wants him in a City uniform. Um you know, uh, they really believe in him. Um, I was told this last summer, you know, so this was even before he ever stepped on, you know, a Bundesliga pitch that the whole plan was for him to go on loan, get some experience and then come back and really compete with Ederson. Um, you know, so to me, it makes sense. 
also is kind of a little surprising. And I think for a lot of people that would be surprising to hear because I think they saw the move and they kind of expected that to just be like a good business move by city, you know, buy him for cheap and then sell him somewhere else. Um, but everything that I'm told, and it's a really, really good source. He was involved in the recruitment of Zach Steffen to city. He said that Steffen's going to be in a city uniform. Um, you know, they're not looking to make, you know, a quick business deal out of this. Look, it could be wrong. Um, you know, but that's, that's what I've been told. And, you know, I think it would be really interesting to see him, you know, in the city setup and see how he develops. Ederson's clearly the number one. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, but to see him learn from Ederson, learn from Pep, um, you know, and see how he can develop his game further. I think it'd be really, really interesting to see. Um, you know, and then obviously it's up to him to, to grow, develop and, you know, put the pressure, you know, for some game time, you know, and then, I mean, obviously if that happens, I mean, sky's the limit. Yeah. Omar, any thoughts? Uh, I mean, as obviously as American fans and as Americans, I think we definitely want to see him uh, compete for that. And I hope that sets a precedent for uh, the future and for young goalkeepers out there to not just uh, settle with the MLS, but have aspirations to go and, and play in Europe. And I think he's the catalyst of that in our generation. Obviously, we had Tim Howard, Guzan, uh, Friedel, Keller, all those guys who went abroad. And I think that's the generation behind us now. And I think we need a new kind of face for that. And I'm really hoping that it's not too much pressure on him. And I'm hoping he stays healthy, too. I think those two things, if he can like yeah. withstand the psychological the pressures of being the, the guy in the U.S. number one, I think that's going to be, you know, one, one piece of the, the, pie, uh, the puzzle for him. And the second piece now is just obviously staying healthy. I think he's incredibly athletic. But like we saw with uh, Manuel Neuer when he injured his ankle and kind of like that push and go, how, how successful it made him. Him having to, you know, think twice about every time he takes a step on his, you know, yeah. uh, clearances or balls over the top. That extra second, that trigger can kind of take away from somebody's uh, instincts and I'm really hoping that with Zach he can come back at 100% so that his instincts can really maximize his full physical potential and I hate to say it but he's physically gifted and for somebody that physically gifted to not have I guess refined the technique just yet he still needs the, the physique and that uh, pu push and plant and go and to have all that he needs to be successful and to have all that he has to be healthy so we'll see what happens. I think one thing about Zach that I, I really liked, you know, and just in regards to personally, just with limited interaction is just, for lack of a better term, kid has a good head on his shoulders. And I think that he could handle the pressure of being at a man city, um, being in that environment. You know, there's a, I, I think there's a lot of, we were talking about, you know, uh, a goalkeepers who, you know, who are having issues, you know, um, psychologically. And obviously, you know, with the, with, with the, the injury issues that, that he's been having. I mean, he just absolutely, you don't wish on anybody, but he's handled them so well as, as such a professional and, and as such a mature yeah. individual. And just in regards to just to like his, his own life, he just, he just, he's a good dude. And I think that he would be able to hand, handle it. No problem. Um, and I think that to be honest with that, I, th I think he can handle the speed of play of city. Um, I think with his feet, I think he'd be fine at city. Just my worry is I don't want to see I don't want to see the U.S. number one not playing, and I know that sounds selfish, you know, in regards to his own development and, and what's best for him financially and 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 career wise and stuff like that. But you know, my concern is is that you know if we have a U.S. number one that that doesn't play for the for their team, you know, is, is that is that is that a bad is that a bad situation, Matt? I think it depends. Um, it, it's it's a really difficult question to answer. Um, in a perfect world, of course, you want your goalkeeper to be playing every single day, but also how many U.S. goalkeepers will have the opportunity to play for Manchester City um, with the manager like Pep Guardiola and, you know, to learn from a goalkeeper like Ederson. You know, it's a very unique situation, you know, and I think it's not to say that I think he should go there and sit on the bench for two or three years because I don't. I don't think that's what's best for his career. But I do think if he can go and he can gain some valuable insight and then, you know, either push for a starting spot or then move on, you know, I think, I think it's okay um, in the short term. Um, long term, for sure, he's got to play. Like, he has to be playing every week. And obviously, in the perfect world, if he's at City, he's going to get cup matches. Hopefully, he's going to be playing some Champions League games, you know, get that experience and hopefully enough to kind of stay, stay fresh. Um, yeah. You know, but it'll be it'll be really interesting, 
you know, kind of see what happens and what plays out. And, you know, if they really do believe in him, um, you know, like I've been told and, uh, you know, see how it all plays out. Yeah. Um, Matt, before we, we kind of move on from the, from the Premier League right here, uh, I just want to ask you, with the transfer window being in a weird situation this year, a lot of contracts are, are up right now and they're still mm-hmm. playing, which is bizarre. Um, this has never happened before, I don't think. Um, do you see any big-time moves happening uh, during this transfer window? Um, ooh, it's hard to say. Um, from the goalkeeper perspective, I think really the only – the only goalkeeper that I've heard being talked about is Ajax's goalkeeper, Onana. Um, I mean, he's like kind of the only one and it sounds like he's going to move on. Um, and he's, I mean, he's, he looks to be the real deal. Um, the question will just be, you know, where he goes from here and, you know, what opportunity he has and how he performs, obviously, because, you know, the Dutch league is good. It's really good. And Ajax is, you know, a hell of a club. But, you know, obviously the talk is that he's going to go to, you know, a massive club, you know, like a Barcelona or a Chelsea or a United, like that type of stature. Um, you know, if he's going to go there, he's, he's going to have to adjust quickly because we see the, uh, the pressures and the standards that are held at those clubs. Yeah. yeah. And Mike, one thing I want to add to this is I think if we could, this is a stretch, Matt, and bear with me here, okay? I'm going to compare Zach Steffen's career to uh, Jasper Sillison in the sense that they're both, they're both number ones for their country. And they're both, obviously, there's a lot of pressure for them to, you know, obviously get games. But Sillison decided he wanted to go to Barcelona, I think, last uh, two years ago. And then he played there for two years now at Valencia. But he went there for two years, competed, played a lot of the cup games, was successful in the cup games, did incredibly well. So he still maintained his peak performance and was obviously with Barcelona because they kind of went so deep in these cup games. He still got that experience playing for a club as, as great as, as, as uh, Barcelona was. So I think he didn't really miss any steps, but he also got the experience of playing in those big, big games. I don't know if he played in any of the Champions League games. I think he may have played in the group stage ones that were the tail end of the group stage where Barcelona had already won the group and Ter Stegen was resting. But I thought that was a huge, you know, one step, two steps back, three steps forward for him because now he's at Valencia. And he, to me at least, he's a, he's a game changer. I just love the way yeah. he plays. And you can tell at Barcelona, he learned a lot from Ter Stegen and learned a lot from wearing that badge. And I'm really hoping that if Stefan were to go to Man City and, you know, get some minutes in cup games, I feel like that could probably have the same effect on him. And at yeah, least that's a great shout. Great comparison. Yeah. I was actually just going to say, I'm just glad he left Barcelona because honestly, like sometimes it was very difficult for me to tell who was actually playing in goal at Barcelona, whether, whether it was Ter Stegen or still was... But it's rough, so man. I, that, that, that's tough. I can't even imagine. That's why I think, you know, I love doing what I do, but sometimes, like Matt said, the psychological thing with De Gea, you know, I think uh, sometimes you, you bypass or you overthink how critical that psychological piece is and how important that is to everything that's happening from their warm up to the decision making to whatever's happening mm-hmm. in that game. And for me, at least I will say that I am a, a catalyst sometimes of being the person to call out a technique versus thinking about the psychological pressures prior to that. Um, and I think that, you know, I can't even imagine Sillison's like checking the ego at the door where he's like, yes, I'm going to go compete. Maybe he had something completely different in his mind. Like I'm going to, beat Ter Stegen out and maybe he had that idea but also too of like yeah he didn't beat Ter Stegen out like he thought he would have but he stayed there he stayed obviously motivated but also too he never really opened his mouth he's like yeah I remember an article I read about him he's like yeah sure I want to be playing but like I'm also learning a a great ton from Mm -hmm. one of Germany's best goalkeepers probably the best goalkeeper in the world so I think that is again the psychological thing I don't know how those professionals balance that but I know I probably couldn't and I think that's probably why I didn't want to go pro because I just knew that if I'm not getting paid that much here with the Galaxy 2s, so I'm not going to try and, you know, go through this midlife crisis at 21. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. But you could have you made a great life for yourself, dude. Look at Matt. Look at Matt. You could, uh, you could be a, a big-time goalkeeper analyst like Matt now if you had, uh, had, had stuck, it, stuck it out on that, that pro side. Uh, I will say, I, though. I think I'm, Omar's Matt, doing yeah. all right for himself. <laughs> No, but I, but I will say, you know, I definitely have, you know, ideas of, of, you know, when I post stuff and everything like that, but I think what allows you to be such a great writer and what allows you to speak from experience is that you've been at those high press, uh, pressure situations where you can kind of almost get into the mindset of the person you're writing about or the, the who the article is about. And I don't know if you have more empathy for them, but I know you have 
like a different perspective that I think obviously non goalkeepers wouldn't have or goalkeepers who played at a, you know, very lower level because you don't understand and you don't understand like the, the pressures and the situations, maybe the locker room talks or the disputes with the coach or the goalkeeper coach, not having the same goalkeeper coach all season, your goalkeeper coach leaves, right. you know, all those little things that if you had never played professionally or you weren't exposed to those things, you can't really empathize or write from a direction of, okay, he gets it, you know? Right. No, absolutely. Um, let's, let's talk about that then. Let's, uh, let's go into, uh, into goalkeeper analysis and, uh, and its role in the media. Um, because, you know, Omar, you just brought that up right now in regards to the fact that, like, Matt has that playing experience, which, uh, which, which is one of those things that I think is, is extremely valuable in regards to when you're writing about something, whether you, you have a coaching background or you have a playing background. Um, I think that's one of the things that's missing a lot of times when it comes to goalkeeper analysis um, in traditional media is that a lot of times the people that are giving the information uh, have not played the position or have not coached the position. So, um, Matt, why don't you kind of break down kind of like what uh, the difference is between kind of like an analyst and a journalist so that people kind of understand, you know, is there a difference or can, can you be both um, for, for kind of laymen out there? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I think the easiest way to distinguish the two is – you know, someone who's a journalist, like they're all about coverage. So they're all about getting scoops, breaking news, um, you know, in that way. And then an analyst is basically bringing insight, you know, and any type of information onto what's happening. So kind of like how Omar was just talking about, um, you know, and for me, from my perspective, it's about taking you inside the mind of the goalkeeper. Um, anybody can, in my opinion, there's a lot of people who are qualified out there to talk about like technical deficiencies. But where I think I separate myself is actually bringing in the whole understanding and the thought process of what goalkeepers are actually going through. And like Omar had alluded to, because I've been through it, um, you know, and I think that's something that's totally missing. Um, I think it's starting to come into media more and more, um, you know, and I think that's why obviously there's a huge hole in understanding and why, you know, there's a lot of myths that are portrayed, you know, and I mean, we could talk about that, you know, in any number of broadcasts, um, you know, spewed. It's just because you don't have people behind the mics who have ever stood in between the posts, you know, and to me as someone who watches, like that's infuriating because they're, they're not just doing the goalkeepers disservice, but also they're spreading misinformation, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that as well, you know, it hurts the position. It hurts, I think, kids who are, who are watching and wanting to play um the position because they love the position um you know and i'll go i'll bring this back to joe hart at the beginning you know if you listen to that i think it's like a two and a half minute clip on bbc sport you know he talks about it at the end because he talks about like why now he's discussing mental health is because like when he started talking to young kids like who are like 10 to 12 years old who are asking him about his career they're not asking him about all the amazing things that he did they're asking him how do you deal with the mistake and that's crazy because no kid should be ever thinking about that. Um, I know I didn't like for me, like it was just about going out and playing the game and loving the game. And obviously at some point you have to learn how to deal with that. That's something I struggled with a lot throughout my career. Um, but it's not something a kid should ever have to worry about because you know, for them, it's supposed to be pure. You're supposed to just go out there and love the game and love what you do. And I think that's, you know, not just a symptom of, of, the world we live in but also i think in the coverage you know because i think there is and it's not to say that all the coverage needs to be positive coverage but it just needs to give an understanding you know and i think you know when you put that out there and you create that environment for people you know it's it's only good yeah no and i think yeah. just selfishly i'll just be straight up honest it's like the, instead of instead of trying to trying to do a job that you might not necessarily be qualified for, bring in someone like ourselves, any 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 one of us right here, into that into that desk, onto that desk, you know, to do the analysis, you know, at halftime or post game or whatever, as opposed to trying to break it down. You know, I mean, there's a goalkeeper coach, pretty much on every on every squad, and yet when it comes to analysis you know, there's, there's usually one person and, and generally they, they ask them to do everything. I mean, maybe that, maybe that's one of the solutions and maybe, you know, this isn't the world right now, budget wise, uh, to try to be bringing in people just to talk, go, talk to about goalkeeping. But, but I, I think, I think it could be, 
I think it could, could be extremely, extremely beneficial. So let's, let's talk about the fact about Matt, what you're talking about, the mistakes, right? Um, Omar's pointed this out a lot on his social media is that a lot of times whenever a goalkeeper is featured in traditional media, it's always because of a major error yeah. and not because of anything, anything positive, you know? So how do we change that narrative, Omar? Um, like you said, I mean, we need to have people who understand the position and who have been through it. And I think, uh, you know, back to the, back to Matt's point though, another thing that I would want to bring up to kind of finish off that point is the idea that I think a lot of the coverage is just lazy and I think it's lazy, you know, you talk about like armchair, back, you know, whatever, armchair goalkeeping or uh, backseat, you know, driving, whatever it is, you just, you just sit there and all you do is criticize and criticize. And sometimes the people who are criticizing have never done it. And I think what allows or what I've had to come through the process and realization is that I think it was uh, Lee from the modern, modern day GK on Instagram. Um, I had always thought this, but they had really posted it, re- I think two, th- two or three days ago that really kind of find help me find my I guess articulated words with this is that De Gea makes a mistake he sweeps his feet and it goes in everyone talks about it but two weeks ago he makes that incredible save or routine save and no one says a word so it's about it's like laziness in the sense of we're only bringing it up when it fits our narrative and I think that is to me what I think is the issue right now is goalkeeper minds and goalkeepers understand that there is, there shouldn't be a narrative with goalkeeping because it should be a holistic approach. Meaning, for example, if I say, you know, Matt on this one V one, he came out completely, did the spread save and they just chipped it over his head, man, what's wrong with well, him? Well, Matt well, is that having would never a, Matt. Happen, that would never happen to Matt. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be like, Matt's having an awful year and I could, you know, and again, a lot of these people don't watch the full game. So they'll never, they'll never question unless it's like serious people who watch all the time. But for the most part, people will be like, Oh, Matt's horrible. You know, I read the article. Did you see this? Did you see that? The headline said that looking for a new goalkeeper and then, you know, an actual goalkeeping uh, analyst would say, look, Matt made this mistake on this 1v1, but a week ago, he actually did incredibly well to stay up. What's the difference? You see the difference there? It's now we're talking about his 1v1 technical uh, technique and his approach, but we're not saying that he's a bad goalkeeper. It's more of a discussion of what, had, what changed. So now we're not talking about the actual technique. We're thinking about the psychological thing. So what did his coach say something to him? Did he have an error in training that may have caused him to try something new? You know what I mean? So now we're going deeper than just surface level. And I think that is the difference between people who understand the position and people who don't. People who, want, who, understand, who don't understand it, they just want headlines. And people who, don't, people who do understand it want solutions. And I think that is the biggest thing. And that's, that's the reason why I have my channel and why I do it. Because I'm like, I've been that goalkeeper who makes those mistakes. But criticizing me is not going to help me. So why, why don't you just show me as somebody else who may have done it similar to me, but did it right. So now I can see the, the two and how the pressure on the defender may have ch- you know, changed my decision or my approach. So that's kind of my mindset with everything. And that's hopefully that all made sense. No, no, no. It, it made sense. It was only a five minute ramble. It's totally, totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I always feel, I always no, feel it, that. It's all, it's all good. Actually, I want to give a shout out to the uh, NWSL because they've actually been doing a really good job of giving positive goalkeeping coverage during the uh, NWSL Challenge Cup, um, you know, through CBS. And it's, this is not a CBS show. Uh, I've, just, I've just recognized it. And, and when I see things like that, I think that's just so important, especially when you're talking about the youth. The youth. I mean, I straight up will tell you, because of the way the media portrays David De Gea, I've had kids come up to me, they're like, oh, David De Gea, that dude's trash, right? Like literally, I'm not, and I'm not kidding. It's, and, and it's because they're being fed this narrative, not even recognizing the level of a goalkeeper that David De Gea is. Um, and, Dean, and, and Henderson, want, Dean, Dean Henderson's reps are the, all these article writers. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's all Dean Henderson's reps. It's just his publicist doing it uh, back, back and forth. And, and for whatever reason, uh, Matt, and I don't know if you've noticed this, I've noticed in Bundesliga coverage, they are more supportive of the goalkeeper. Uh, than they tend to be in in the prem in the Premier League. I don't know if that's just the British media loves to tear tear people down. Um, I, it's just it's just something that I've I've noticed personally, and maybe maybe I'm completely crazy about that. Um, in Matt, should there be a goalkeeper expert like in the booth though? Like, do you, do you like that idea? Is that something that that would be cool? Should we hire you? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would love to do it. My uh, my DMs are open on Twitter. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a must, 
you know, and I think there's a lot of qualified people out there. I mean, like for me to have somebody like Peter Schmeichel, who is very well articulated, who obviously has been through everything there is to be as a goalkeeper. To me, he's somebody who should be in Sky Sports every single week. Um, you know, and he, he should be a color commentator. And it doesn't mean that he needs to be discussing everything that happens in the game. But, you know, anytime something that happens with a goalkeeper and that is newsworthy and just, you know, teams talking about, he should be chiming in, um, you know, and I look at, uh, you know, like American football, like they do that in American football, you know, in the States, you know, in the I, was, I was literally going to bring that, bring that up. There's always an ex quarterback. It seems. Yeah, like. correct. Cor correct. And I think in a position that is so influential as a goalkeeper position, because you're always involved, whether it's a good or a bad thing happening during the day of the game, goals are going to be scored on almost every single match. And if they're not scored, it's, probably because the goalkeeper did something pretty amazing. So like, you're going to be talking about it. And to me, it's like, it's one of those positions where it just, it needs to be discussed. And, you know, I'm all for, like, I've had a couple discussions with some, some other coaches and, and like, to me, the future of, of soccer, football, uh, whatever you want to say, it's going like American football with specialized uh, coaches. You know, obviously goalkeeper coaches have existed for a while, but you know, every team should have a striker coach, midfield coach, center backs coach, winger coach, wing back coach. Um, you know, and there's really no, no excuse, at least at the premier league level, why you don't, because you have the funding for it. Um, you know, because it's obviously, it's gonna, it's gonna produce, you know, results. Um, well, well, you know, well, Franz, I, think that, I think that's the future. I was going to say just a couple of weeks ago, Franz Hook, when he, when he was on the show, he talked about, you know, um, set piece coaches and just mm -hmm. how, how absolutely beneficial that is to have yep. a set piece coach. Um, and he's actually going to be teaching, I think, a, a set piece course, which I, I, would love, I would love to take because honestly, it's such something that's so intricate. And, and honestly, um, I'm just not as well versed as I should be honestly, on set pieces. Um, yes, I've spent time in, in a goal, setting up walls and all that stuff, but that does not mean I'm an expert in free, in free kicks by any stretch of imagination or throw-ins. Um, so, so I think that that absolutely needs to be valued. I, I love the fact of you bringing up something like, like every time I hear Casey Keller on ESPN, for instance, and giving analysis, I'm so excited because I'm like, oh my mm -hmm. gosh, somebody who's been there before, I totally listen to everything he has to say because it's like, it's like, it's like him being on the show right now with us. You know, it doesn't feel like an outsider talking about it. And I don't mean that disrespectful for anybody who wants to try about talk about goalkeeping, but you know, um, there's, it's just, if you're not part of the goalkeeping union, it's very, it's very, very difficult to, to have that, to have that connection with us at least. Um, I want to, I want to bring this up in regards to uh, goalkeeper analysis. What do you consider proper goalkeeper analysis and what's, what, for lack of a better term, is bad goalkeeper analysis or lazy? I actually want to ask you guys because I want to know okay. what you guys like to hear and okay. uh, what maybe infuriates you guys, you know, when you do hear it spewed from the TV set. Um, I mean, one thing that I, that, that I can't stand is when a goalkeeper is out of position or um, – they had made a mistake from an, from an angle play standpoint. And then the, the, uh, the uh, announcer cheers for how fantastic this play was and how, how well the goalkeeper did in the situation. I can't tell you how, especially in MLS, I've seen it happen over and over again, where I'm like, Oh, this was a bad play, but because the guy scrambled and, and got lucky, you know, they're like, wow, this, he's just got the reflex cat like reflexes and like unbelievable keeping the team in the game. And you're like, Ooh, no, he actually just, he just got lucky there. Um, Omar, any, any, any others you would want to throw in? Uh, I mean, I just, I'm from my own experience, I think when I first started the channel and, and, you know, was able to get some of those, uh, some of those posts out, I was really eager to always have a, a critique and always have a technical solution. And after a while, I realized that a lot of the times, more often than not, it's just stuff happens in goalkeeping. Yeah. And th there is no, there is no, there shouldn't be, you have to have a take on everything. And I think that's my complaint with analysis is that these guys, in my opinion, are almost forced to wear the goalkeeping hat because they're all, you know, they're more, you know, uh, analysis of like field players and kind of those intricate details. And because they're not, you know, previous goalkeepers they are kind of forced to have somewhat of a surface understanding of goalkeeping. And they, I feel like sometimes, like you said, Mike, they always have to have 
a comment about something that happens with goalkeeping when sometimes they could just say, you know, didn't go his way, unfortunate circumstances. This probably could have done better, but they really tear these guys down. And I think I was definitely one of those people at the beginning where every time a De Gea mistake would happen or Kepo would make a mistake or Courtois would let it go through his legs, people would reach out to me and say, like, bro, you're about to be busy tonight. I'm like, oh, no, did somebody mess, did somebody mess up? Do I have to run to my computer? Do I have to run? So now I kind of changed it up where I've kind of like cheated the system a little bit where I'm like, you know, hey, this goal happened today. I'll post like a picture of, De, you know, De Gea's mistake or him hands on his hips, which happens a lot. And I'll say, guys, like, what would you have done different? So mm-hmm. now I'm not, I'm not criticizing, in my opinion, I'm not criticizing it, but I'm trying to find like hundreds of solutions or hundreds of ways of how people are seeing it. And that kind of gives me a perspective into the psyche of, you know, goalkeepers from all around the world and how they perceive certain things. And most of the time people will always have, this guy sucks, this guy's horrible, but every once in a while, probably, you know, three out of 10 posts, somebody will comment and say, you know, the psychological approach or uh, the technique was wrong here. He could have gone with this, but it, it just creates a dialogue, which I think is missing in the goal keeping world I think I think the quarantine has been huge for those coaches who were so guarded and didn't want to share their stuff now because their peers were opening up and you know going on podcasts and stuff they were kind of forced into that and it's you could see how the goalkeeping uh, culture has shifted in my opinion how open everybody is to sharing ideas how willing how willingly they are to know to it now and I think that's going to better uh, the community it's going to better the analysis in the future and I hopefully will better uh, goalkeeping down the line yeah you know you know, one, one thing I, I want to bring up with, with Matt right here is that language, I think, is so important. And, and Omar bringing up the mistakes, I think it's the way that you present the same content, right? And you know this with your writing, obviously, is this, how you write this is going to change, change the whole point of view that someone's going to have when they're, re- when they're reading the piece, right? Uh, so instead of, instead of mistake, you know, uh, you know, incident instead of mistake. And then like, you know, uh, variations, you know, instead of wrong, you know, like, uh, you know, or right, Th- those sorts of things. Right. Yeah, totally. And I think I agree with a lot of what Omar said. And I, the only thing that bothers me a little bit now is I think, I think there's a lot more people who are discussing goalkeeping, especially on social media, but I feel that there's a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking going on. And, and what I mean by that is like, after the fact, you know, you're sitting on your computer, you're slowing it down frame by frame and you're like, Oh, his leg was out of position here. Oh, his hand was out of position here. And it's like, okay, but put yourself, and this is what I try to do with my writing. Um, And Sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's easy, but I try to put myself in the mind of the goalkeeper. How would he have been thinking in this moment? Where was his defender's positioning? What was actually happening before the play? You know, I saw some comments this last week because Romero was playing in the cup game for United. He got beat from distance and, you know, he was set around a six yard box, you know, and the discussion was, okay, he's too far off his line. He should have backpedaled to his line. But the thing is, like, as the play was developing, he had to have a high line because his defense had a high line. And if they played a through ball, which was very, very possible, he would have to go out and either spread himself or smother the ball. So for him to actually be on the back of his line there was not realistic. Um, You know, and you have to actually put yourself in the mind of where should he be positioned and why. Um, And besides the fact, like, the way that the play broke down, there was no way he had time to backpedal to his line. Um, you know, so I think things like that are very, very important. Um, you know, and again, like I said, just putting yourself in the mind because we can talk about technical breakdowns and technical things all the time, but more often than not, I mean, these guys at the top, they are so technically proficient. Um, you know, if you're playing in the Premier League, you're the best of the best. And it's not like these guys are going, going out and they have holes in their game. Um, you know, things where, you know, the best goalkeepers separate themselves, it's totally psychological, you know, and that's why I'd asked you, Omar, earlier what you thought about De Gea, because for me, it's totally psychological. Like for him, it's not, I mean, of course there's technical breakdowns, but it's all because of what's going on inside his head. Uh, For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think you even, even, oh, sorry, Mike, uh, but Matt, I think even, even with the Romero goal, I think, I think the biggest thing is that a goalkeeper who has played that position and understands 
I, I think Mike has done a good job with me as well as like, Hey, stop looking at the finished product that you see of the yeah. goal and stop analyzing that. And let's understand the holistic, like what happened prior to that and why that yes, goalkeeper. Exactly. So even if you watch the Romero goal, I, I would, you know, I think it can't well score. It was like a, uh, you know, pass from the left side to about 25 yards outside the 18 and you know took a touch in and if you see there are runners coming across yeah. I'm not sure I'm not sure if Romero is is trying to play the percentages of okay if he plays that ball through maybe I'm already on a high line and I can come and cheat that but it looks mm -hmm. to me like that's what he was doing so yes in my head I would probably be like you know he probably could have done better on the shot but if I'm un trying to understand and not critique, that is the, that's the unlock right there. It's like, how can I understand why he decided this or uh, made this decision versus let me look for something or let me just try and critique this guy. And I think in right. that one specifically, yes, could he have been deeper, had more depth, had more time to react? Sure. But yeah. at the same time, there are, there are two runners coming across the 18 where yes. you can easily slip them through. And so if I was him, I'd probably be on that front foot kind of cheating up a little bit of a higher line playing my percentages and if that ball comes through and he comes out and does a spread save or beats them to the ball we're applauding the guy he's picking it up and going to the next thing or we're not even applauding him because it's kind of going to be in the highlights you know what i mean and that's that's what i mean though it's like there's so many of those little little details that we miss out unless you watch the full game and i think a lot of the people who are commentating about the games are the ones who are watching the highlights and reading the headlines only yeah, and I, I want to tell a lot of young goalkeepers out there, you know, uh, because if, even if you try to watch the extended highlights, you're not going to catch the goalkeeper. I mean, I straight up sign up for, I, I, and again, we don't have a sponsorship with them, but like sign up for Y Scout because that's where you're going to, you're going to be able to get all the, all the clips. You're going to be able to get all the distribution clips. You're going to be able to get all, all, all the full, through ball clips, all of that yeah. stuff. Um, so, and it's really, really important for you to be able, if you can't sit there and watch two hours, at least you can watch, you know, 10 minutes worth of, 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 of moments. And I, I love the fact, Omar, you brought up about just that, like everyone focuses when it comes to goalkeeper analysis on the final action. And, and Matt, like, like you're saying, it's extremely important. It's like, it's not, it's not just that moment before it's the moment before the moment before, you know, because it's that buildup of the play that leads to the final action. So we really need to know what happened all that way through. And also I just want to say personally, like when I was, you know, talking about Ederson and saying like, Oh, you know, um, his, you know, poor, uh, you, know, you know, poor deflections, you know, playing balls in bad areas and so, sort of stuff. Like put me in that position. I'm probably, it, it's first off, it's in the net. It's not even, I'm not even stopping it. And, and, sec and second of all, we are nitpicking here. We are nitpicking here based on the level of competition that they're, they're going up against, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, I just wanted people just to not, not yell at me on social media and go like, you just said Ed Ederson's not that good. And like, I was trying to, all right. Um, <laughs> well, you're comparing him to one of the best in the world, man. And that's like, that's and, the and hard that's part too. And that's the thing. Yeah. And that's the thing. In my opinion, Allison Becker is, is the best goalkeeper in the world. And there can be an argument between, you know, um, to stay again, all black. Yeah. black. Yeah. black. They're my top obviously. three. Yeah. Yeah. They're just um, consistent, man. And the thing is like to, yeah. to finish off that point, I think you're just looking for a goalkeeper. I tell them all the time, like the number one thing that a coach is looking for is peace of mind. And how do you attain peace of mind is consistency. And how do you have consistency yeah. is that you train all the little things and all the little details in training so that when you step into a game, you're well equipped to deal with any scenario that's thrown at you. And I think a lot of the kids uh, don't understand that and don't understand that these guys have been great for so many years that that is the reason why we're talking about them and why, you know, why we're talking about Joe Hart on the other side of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, before we go, because I know we've been going for like an hour and a half right now, by the way. And I, I was actually, I was like, I was a little worried. I was like, oh man, I think we're just going to talk Premier League for an hour and a half. I don't know. I don't know if we're ever going to get to this, this topic. Cause I that think was this a good is a, episode. Yeah. This, this is a, this is an important, uh, important topic, but, uh, Matt, if you had to give any little words of advice or wisdom to a young, you know, goalkeeper who wants to start writing about goalkeeping um, or analyzing goalkeeping a little bit more profoundly, and Omar, I'll let I'll let you throw into this too because apparently you're very well known in this community too. Um, <laughs> feel free. Like, what 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 are the words of wisdom you guys would give them? Uh, for me, from my perspective, just write. Like, if it interests you, just start writing. Um, don't worry if it's good or not. Um, just put you know, your thoughts to paper, um, because they will develop, um, over time and you'll just get better, you know, and especially if you want to be an analyst or you want to be a journalist and you want to write about things, watch a lot of football. And especially from the goalkeeper perspective, watch goalkeepers from all different leagues around the world because they all do it differently. And especially from league to league, 
there's different tendencies, there's different technical nuances to the way that they play. And, you know, that's how you learn. Um, you know, and I think the biggest thing is to keep an open mind. You know, I think especially I had a conversation with, with a coach through Twitter the other day. Um, you know, and one of the things that really infuriates me is when you have people talking about like this one way is the only way. Who says? Um, you know, there's lots of different ways to actually get the final outcome. You know, and I think it's just about like what works for Ter Stegen, for example, probably doesn't work for Allison. One, because physically they're different goalkeepers and they have a different skill set and different genetic makeup. Um, you know, and it's just like you, you can't fit a, uh, you know, as Stan Anderson used to say, square peg in, square peg in a round hole. Um, yeah, by the way, know, shout out to Stan Anderson for, for telling literally everybody at Camp Shutout to come on to this, uh, this live, live stream. It, yeah, he's, he's literally he's just a, posting, posting and posting. He, he's, he's a hell of an advertiser. Uh, for sure. No, he's one of the best. Um, yeah, but I mean, like for me, it's just, it's just keep an open mind, watch as much as you can and just try to learn. Like that's my biggest advice. Omar? Uh, from my own experience of trial and error, I would say... Top hand saves do... only, right? <laughs> no, but, but when you do write about something, uh, honestly, be well-equipped to deal with criticism. And I think to be well equipped to deal with criticism, you have to do your homework, whether it's the uh, statistical backing, whether it's actual evidence, whether it's actual video footage. I think that is the number one thing is when you have something that you want to write about, making sure that you're un of the understanding that not everybody's going to agree with what you're writing. And that's half the battle because I think a lot of writers and a lot of people like myself who are content creators, when you go into it thinking everyone's going to love you and everything you post is going to be amazing, two things are going to happen. One, someone's going, to, someone's going to burst your bubble and you're going to have a rude awakening. But also two, if you have everybody who's agreeing with you, then you're never going to grow because no one's ever going to challenge you. So just be open to criticism. Like Mike, I mean, I tell you, Mike, you're one of the people who's criticized me the most and I've grown the most because of you. And I think that is, you need people to, to call you out on certain things. And when they do, you need to have your evidence. You need to have your backing as to why you're writing from an objective point of view. And it's not an opinion based, but it's actual factual evidence. And when you have factual evidence and things that people can, I mean, they can look at it and they can still disagree with you. But if they look at it and they can at least go, ah, I see where Matt was coming from with this one. Okay. Even though I don't agree with you, I could see why you wrote this versus yeah. nitpicking a specific technical flaw and error and magnifying that and saying how this technical error speaks volumes of how bad this goalkeeper is. It's like, no, how about you show me when he's made that mistake three, four, five, six times. So now as the person who's reading this article or watching the video you're posting, I'm like, okay, while I don't agree because I've probably seen, you know, the whole his games and I've seen how well he plays, I understand why this article was written. And I think you're going to gain a lot more respect and garner more respect from people uh, when you do have your homework done like that. I absolutely love what you just said there. And I think, you know, recognizing those trends and seeing themes before you go out and post or write yes. about something is so important. And I know, Matt, I know you take your time before before you write something you know you really do your research and, and you you look more for you know what has led to where we are right now as opposed to like this is what happened on sunday you know right you know which i, I think personally is just is more profound writing and just a little bit deeper and, and and you're you're giving a little bit more back and it's a little and it's harder it takes more work you know yeah it, it, it's super stressful i'm not gonna lie um especially when you have a quick turnaround uh, you know, when you actually do have a deadline, it can be quite stressful, uh, you know, and it's lots of hours of writing. Um, but it's just about, you know, it's like, for me, I take a pride in what I'm putting out there, you know, and I want it to be the best. So I do obsess over it in a lot of ways, like I did when I was a player, um, you know, with obsessing over training and matches and, and everything else. Um, but it's fun. Like, you know, for me, I just, I love putting, you know, content out in the world and, and, like I said, continuing to learn for myself because it's not like, like I've looked back at some of my articles that I've written in the past and I'm just like, Ooh, why did I write that? <laughs> uh, you know, just, just, just because like you grow, you grow and develop and maybe like you learn something along the way that maybe would have changed your perspective if you could write that same article now. Um, you know, and I think I want to touch on something that Omar had said earlier, you know, kind of about criticism. I think it's important. Criticism is so important, but listen to criticism from people who know what they're talking about. 
Yeah. Um, general random people commenting, um, that does, you no good. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I know a lot of different, uh, people say this, don't read the comments. Um, you know, and just kind of listen to the people who you trust, um, you know, because that can also kind of ruin you. Um, you know, because if you're not, you know, one, one, uh, one person I love a lot is, is Brene Brown. Um, you know, and, and she talks about like, if nobody, like, if they're not in the arena, why does their criticism matter? You know, if they're not actually, you know, in that level of expertise that you are, and they're not actually putting themselves out there, you know, it's, it, who cares what that person says? Um, you know, so criticism definitely plays a role. It's very, very important. Um, that's how you learn. Um, you know, but also you have to be careful where that criticism comes from as well. No, absolutely. Um, well, let's, uh, let's start wrapping up here mainly because I have a dentist appointment that I have to get to. Um, so at, at some point I have to have to make it over to the, to the dentist, man, I, I cut this way too close, but like, I was so worried about, I've been like rescheduling this dentist appointment over and over again until finally, uh, my neuroses would let me go to the dentist. And so it's happening now. <laughs> Um, uh, Matt, uh, if anybody out there, they want to, they want to read all your stuff. First off, they got to subscribe to the athletic, definitely subscribe yeah. to the athletic. If you haven't subscribed to the athletic yet, guys, uh, you have, you have to, um, the work is phenomenal. Uh, we've had several athletic writers, uh, on this show right here, um, over and over and over again. Um, they just, they just do such great stuff. Um, I'd love to see you, uh, collab with some of those, uh, MLS assist, assist, uh, guys or, uh, or, or some of the, uh, allocation disorder uh, people on some, on some stuff, Matt, that would be, that'd be pretty awesome. Um, they got, yeah, I would love to, I would love to shout out to all of them, especially the MLS assist crew. Uh, Joe, you know where I'm at, hit me up. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, this is what I love to do. So obviously, uh, you know, like, like <laughs> Michael said, you know, sub subscribe to the athletic and I will say, uh, to the listeners now, if you are not subscribed to the athletic, hit me up in a DM because I have five free month passes available right now. So you'll get a month of free content and then you can sign up afterwards if you so like, which obviously I highly recommend. Um, oh, so hit me up on Twitter at Matt Pizdrowski, uh, DM me. My DMs are always open and uh, yeah, we'll sort you out. Dude, that's uh, we might have to put that in the show notes if that's cool with you, man. Uh, yeah, sure. definitely got to take, take people up on that. And obviously you can reach Omar Zini at pro GK Academy underscore. I was going to say at, uh, don't criticize me underscore, but that's not, uh, <laughs> that's not, that's not the one that it's going to be. Um, remember contacted inside the 18. That's the number 18 media.com. If you have a guest suggestion or a topic suggestion, shout out to all the insiders who asked, uh, about having Matt on to talk premier league. Uh, you guys made it happen. Uh, I had to reach out to him and, uh, he took some time away from his busy coaching and writing schedule, uh, to come on the show to, uh, to do this. And I think, uh, I think as, as the league continues on, I think we'll try to do more Premier League. There's just so much darn soccer, guys. We're trying to cover as, as much stuff out, out there um, and, and, and make sure that we stay on, on top of the domestic game because it is important that we stay on top of the domestic game here. Um, and at Goalkeeper Podcast on all social media platforms. That is all the time on Inside the 18, and I'm about to go to the dentist. Later, guys. <laughs> yeah!